I'm in Psalm chapter 71. I want to read two verses of Scripture for you. Verses 17 and 18. Now I'm reading from the New King James this morning. Here's what the psalmist David wrote. O oh God, you have taught me from my youth. And to this day I declare your wondrous works. Now also, when I am old and gray-headed, God, do not forsake me until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. Building a monument. I'd like to speak to us about that this morning. I thank you, Father, today. For the word of truth, I thank you that we are able to assemble together in this place. I thank you for this word, and I pray that it as it goes forth today, we find lodging in our hearts. Give us ears to hear it, hearts to receive it, minds to comprehend it. We pray sincerely, Lord, that you take the words of this mouth, the meditation of this heart, Lord, that it would magnify your name and be pleasing to you. I pray for every dad here this morning. I pray that you would minister in a very, very special way. I pray for those of us who have lost our dad to this earth, but know that they are on the other side, and someday the reunion will be sweet. I pray that you'll minister to us. I pray for the Lester family today. Our heart is broken for them. A year ago this day, they lost a son, a dad a husband on Father's Day. I pray you'll minister to them, especially today. I pray you will minister to Karen and touch her in body and strengthen her. I praise you for these things, for I ask them in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you so much for your attention today. In the Old Testament, there are great heroes of the Scripture. And in many cases, those heroes would build monuments. Every, every great event that took place in the Old Testament especially, you'll read that there was some type of ark or there was some type of monument uh, that was left to commemorate. And it was always, always uh, mentioned that this would be a mark of remembrance. In other words, it would remind those that came afterwards of a special event or a special person or something, some significant happening that took place. And this would remind them of this. There's a, a, a couple examples I could share with you. When, when Moses came down from the mountain and had received the Ten Commandments, when it was all said and done, God told him to build a monument here at the foot of the mountain to remind people that this is where God spoke and God's commandments were given. Another occasion was the crossing of the Jordan River. Joshua told those that he had chosen from the 12 tribes of Israel that each one was to pick up a stone and uh, must have been a, a fairly large stone for he said put it on their shoulders and carry it to the other side and uh, there make a monument and this would stand as a reference and a reminder to the children of Israel who were possessing the new land that God had brought them to this place. So there are monuments and there are statues and uh, there are, are events of remembrance throughout the scripture. Which leads me to ask this question this morning. How do you build a monument? See, we as dads, we're important to just a few people in the world. I have three sons. They call me dad. They're the only three that can call me dad. There are no others. Trust me. I have three. They call me dad. 
The rest of the world could care less that they call me dad. The rest of the world's not concerned about that. My, my father had six children. We had the unique privilege and honor of calling him dad. My sisters call him daddy, but the brothers, we call him dad. Just sounds a little better. But that was it. That, he was no one else's dad. He was no one of importance as far as the rest of the world was concerned. But to us, he was it. He was the greatest. I know because when I'd go into his house, uh, once he became an elderly man, a gray-headed man, a, a, a man who was somewhat stooped over in his elderly years, I saw the, I saw the coffee cup still sitting next to uh, his coffee pot. World's greatest dad. So I knew then he must be the greatest dad. He won that award somehow. He wore a t-shirt sometimes that said, World's greatest dad. And then when grandchildren come along, they put another one on him. They said, World's greatest grandpa. But to the rest of the world, that meant nothing. But to a small little group of people, that's how they felt. It was a monument to them of how important he was to them. God is glorified in the monuments that we leave to his faithfulness to our lives. But we know that God is the only perfect Father. I always had a problem going to church on Father's Day and the preacher telling me how sorry I was and how I just didn't measure up. Sometimes I really didn't want to go. And I would often think in my mind, well, really the only perfect Father is God Himself. The rest of us, guess what? We're human and we've made our mistakes. Amen? Uh, we've said things along the way that probably we shouldn't have said. We've uh, probably done a few things that we probably shouldn't have done. Amen? It's just uh, because we're human. We're human. Uh, but we have, we have little guys that look up to us. We have little guys that are watching us, and they emulate us. And in fact, uh, I remember as a a young teenager, I was walking down the hallway of the hardwood floor in our home back in West Virginia. And when I popped around the corner, my mother and my grandfather were sitting at the kitchen table and they looked at me and said, Tommy. And, uh, and then my mother said, no, it's Paul. I thought it was Tommy. Tommy was my dad. They said, you walk just like your dad. You sound just like him coming down that hallway. See, that's the way we, we emulate that person that we look up to, that we even begin to look like them. I've looked in the mirror and thought, I looked in it this morning at 5.30. I still had my bed hair, and I thought, man, that looks just like Dad's old hair. And then I realized it was mine. It's gray. Man, it's a mess, and it looks just like his when he gets up. Yeah. But our God, our Father, He's the only perfect Father, so we're not perfect as dads, but we still want to build monuments of what we are leaving behind. So I asked this question this morning. Dad, what does your monument look like? First thing I want to share with you, sister, if you'll help me out here is the foundation of a monument. The true foundation of the monument that we want to leave as dads is this, that we knew the Lord Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We want our children to know that that's the foundation. There is no greater foundation than knowing the Lord Jesus as your Savior. You can't pass anything greater down to your children than them knowing that you loved your relationship with the Lord Jesus. You, you can teach them to 
run. You can teach them to catch a ball or throw a ball. You can teach them dance steps. You can, you can teach your children a lot of things. My grandson, I just mentioned to you this morning, I, I'm actually somewhat proud of him because I've taught him a few wrestling moves along the way. And now he's going much further than I ever thought about going in, in that field. And you can teach them these things. But if you never teach them about the Lord Jesus, you have failed them. Because in eternity, it will make no difference how far you hit the ball. It will make no difference how perfect your dance step was. It will make no difference of whether you tech fall, fall decision or lost a wrestling match. What will make a difference is you knew the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior. And dads, the best thing we could ever leave our children is the legacy of leading them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. That we help them to understand the significance of the monument of the cross, which is the monument of the church. That Jesus alone is the foundation of our monument. Now, we can do a lot of things for them, and we do, and there's nothing wrong with that. We teach them to drive. We worry over them. Amen? They make mistakes. Everybody else's kid can make a mistake, and we'll talk about them. But if our kid makes a mistake, well, you know, they're just being kids. Right? Oh, you've never had that speech. I have. Yeah. Why? Because there's a, there is a difference. There is a, a love. There is a relationship that you have with a child that is your flesh and blood. And we love them. And we provide for them. And we do all that we can to make life easier for them. The one thing that we need to be certain of is that we have shared the Lord Jesus with them. We are building a monument. Let the foundation be Christ. Which takes me to this scripture. Because here's what David said. He says, God, you have taught me from my youth. And th to this day, I declare your wondrous works. We were all young once. We all made our mistakes. You never sped down the highway when you were 17, did you? Well, if you were with me, you did. Well, of course. I was just a kid behind the wheel all by myself. Let's see what this baby will do. Yeah. And then you tried to make the corner, and you done circles. And all of a sudden, you got religion. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. And when everything come to a screeching halt and there was no dents and n nothing had happened, you didn't go home and tell your dad how you had done donuts in the middle of the road. You were just thankful that you got through it. Right? Yeah, because you were young. Here's what David said. How can a young man cleanse his way? He says, by taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Let me not wander from your commandments. Your word have I hidden my heart that I might not sin against you. I'm an old man now, he says. I'm different now. But from my youth I've known you. The Bible said that David was a man after God's own heart, and that's why God chose him above all of his brothers. David had a foundation with God. And that's where you and I need to be today. Our foundation needs to be in Christ. Which brings me to my second point that I want to share with you in building this monument. You've got a foundation, but you've got to have the framework. Now, what's the framework to this building of a monument? David said, to this day I declare your wondrous works. If you never pray with your child... If you, if, you, if you just sit down at the table and start eating and never say grace or blessing, I know that's old-fashioned to a lot of folks. And a lot of folks saw that as just something that 
means nothing. But trust me, in the heart of a young child, it means everything. I had my son, my youngest son, rebuke me one afternoon in a restaurant. When I got my food before he did, and I started eating. And when he got his, he said, Dad, are you going to say grace? And I was sitting there so hungry and tired from the work we had done that I had absolutely forgotten to say grace. But I was thankful for a young son, Joseph, who decided it was time to say grace. And if he's listening to this this morning, I remember that day, my young son. Yes, framework. Let's pray. Do we pray with our children? Do we tell them about Jesus? Or are we too embarrassed or ashamed or humiliated to ever bring up the name of Jesus to our children? Have we ever told our children how we were saved? What happened? The experience we had in Christ? What's wrong with that? We're building a framework here. We're letting them know I came to Christ and I want you to come to Christ. We're letting them know that Jesus is everything in my life and I want him to be everything in your life. No matter what you choose to do in life as an occupation, Christ can still be Lord of your life. You don't have to be a preacher to have Jesus in your heart. I told all three of my sons that. You don't have to be a preacher. You can be whatever you want to be. But make sure you have Jesus in your life. That's what's important. We need to share that with our children and not be afraid to share that with them. We're building a framework. Oh, they, they may reject it today. They may say, Dad, that's old-fashioned. That doesn't, that doesn't mean anything anymore. But you still keep living it. And you still keep saying it because you're building a framework. Be afraid to tell them on Father's Day, I'm going to church. I told my little grandson this morning on text, good luck the rest of the day. I have to go preach now. I'm letting him know I'm doing the Lord's work. I want him to understand that, how important that is, the priority of Christ in your life. Build a framework. Pray with your children. Out loud, not in silence. Talk to God like you're talking to your best friend. Let your children know that you have a relationship with Jesus. If your child doesn't have a relationship with Jesus and you can't answer those questions that I just asked, when, when's the last time you shared with your child the wondrous works of God? When's the last time you knelt beside the bed with your child? When's the last time you shared your personal testimony with your child? If you can't answer those questions, don't blame it on the church and the preacher when your child doesn't come to Christ. Amen? Now, I went from, I went from being all happy with you to preaching. But it's truth. You have to build a framework. David said... I declare your wondrous works. You're walking along with your child. Let them know that all this beauty that you see in creation came from God the Father. Let them know who God truly is. I want to give you a little excerpt from a song. Some of you probably know this song. I'll not try to sing it. I'll just give you the words. I was driving through town, just my boy and me, with a happy meal in his booster seat, knowing that he couldn't have the toy till his nuggets were gone. Then a green traffic light turned straight to red. I hit my brakes and mumbled under my breath. His fries went a-flying and his orange drink covered his lap. Within my four-year-old said a four-letter word, that started with S, and I was concerned. So I said, son, now where'd you learn to talk like that? He said, I've been watching you, Dad. Ain't that cool? I'm your buckaroo. I want to be like you. Want to eat all my food and grow as tall as you are. 
We got cowboy boots and camo pants. Yeah, we're just alike. Hey, ain't we, Dad? I want to do everything you do. So I've been watching you. The framework. The framework. I wrote these words. They're on the screen for you this morning. And the reason I wrote these words on the screen is because I wanted to see the mag- uh, us to see the magnitude of these words as I thought through this week in this message, what kind of monument are we building? Are we leaving anything behind they can hold on to? What's more important to us? How far they can throw a ball? How fast they can run? How many earthly awards they can receive? How many dance steps they can learn? Will we leave them a legacy that shows we were a faithful man to God, to our family, to our church. That's how you build the framework of a monument, which brings me to my final point this morning. David said this in these words, until I declare your strength to this generation, your power to everyone who is to come. He talked about the finished monument because there's coming a moment, there's coming a time when you and I will be no more. Should the Lord tarry, we will leave behind a legacy, a monument, our children. What will they say about us? Remember, monuments are built to be a reminder. David said, let me declare your strength to this generation. He meant the generation of his kind, his peers. And then he went on to say, And Lord, your power to everyone who is to come. My children, my grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, my great-great, the Lord tarries that long. Will they look back and say, Oh, yeah, yeah, our grandfather, our grandpa, he was a preacher. Will they remember that? Oh, yeah, my, my grandpa, he was a rancher. He owned land over here. My grandpa, he was a real estate man. He sold and bought Perkins, Oklahoma, Harlan Wells. What will be the monument? What will be the finished work? What will they say about you? What will they say about you? Oh, he loved Jesus. Uh, He went to church. He helped build a church. He was... Strong in the community. He did good things for people to make life better. Can you finish your, your monument today? The foundation is Christ. The framework is there. But are you going to finish this monument? What will your family say? What will your friends say? Here's a, here's a, a real pointed question. Will they have doubts? about where you went when you passed? Will there be that little hint of hesitation in the back of their mind? Did he make it? It's a terrible question of anguish. Let them know. Let them know while you live how real Jesus is to you and how much he means to you. How about your children? Do you want to be responsible for your children's eternity? It's more. It's more than what I see in the modern life. It's more. We need to share Jesus with them. They need to know the importance of serving God. That's how you build a monument. I want to share these three things with you as I close. I put them on the screen for your reading. Here's what we do as dads. We teach them intentionally. The scripture tells us, these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons 
and you shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. That's intentional teaching. That is sharing with them all about God, the great universe, who Jesus is, why it's so important to serve the Lord, why it's so important to be in church, why it's so important to live your life for Christ. Our children need to learn what it means to be a godly man or woman by hearing what we say and watching what we do. Secondly, train them with diligence. The Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Whether it's driving a car, whether it's about dating, whether it's managing a budget or grilling the perfect steak, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty in training your child on the good things to do. Walk beside them as much as you can, saying this is how you do it, and let them try it, teaching as you go. You'd be amazed by their confidence. And thirdly, raise them to stand on their own. Paul said to Timothy, these things command that they may be blameless, but if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Our role is to prepare our children to walk on their own someday, to live according to God's principles in his word because the family was designed for spouses to stay together and for children to leave, to make it a goal to raise confident, independent, faithful children who live for the Lord even when we're not around. What kind of monument are you building today? Dad? Parent? Individual? What are you leaving behind? What is it that you want people to say about you? I don't know about you. I want my sons to say he served God. I want them to say that. And I want them to do that. It's my daily prayer. My oldest son is 45, soon be 46. My youngest is 38. I still pray for them. I still pray for my grandchildren every day. I call their name to the Lord. I hurt for them. I share something with you this morning. My oldest granddaughter lives in a world of darkness, but I pray for her because I love her. She's part of me. Are we building a foundation? Let's not give up. What kind of monument are we building? Here's the best way that we could sum up what I've talked to you about this morning, and that is this. We need to lead them to the greatest monument ever built. It's on a hill called Mount Calvary. It's a cross. We need to lead them to the cross and let them know that right here is where all humanity was taken care of. God the Father looked down upon a sinful, wicked, evil world and sent His only begotten Son that whosoever would believe on Him would not perish but have everlasting life. Let's lead them to the greatest monument ever built, the cross of Jesus. And then let's leave with them a monument of the life that we lived before them. Would you stand with me this morning? If our worship team would come. I don't know where you're at this morning. I, I don't know what you may have expected as you come to church on Father's Day to hear. But I've delivered my heart this morning. 
because I really believe that as a parent, we leave a legacy. As a grandparent, we leave a legacy. We leave a monument. As I said to you in the beginning, this monument of parenthood, the world doesn't care, but there's people in your life that really care. They really care. They look up to you. They look up to me. They hear what we say and what we don't say. They hear our prayers or they don't hear our prayers. They hear about our God or they don't hear about our God. They hear about our life at the church or they don't see our life at the church. It's up to us how we build the monument. Father, I thank you today for the truth of your word. I pray for every dad in this place. I pray even for myself this morning. My heart trembles in the presence of God as a dad. I have failed. I have sought your forgiveness, the forgiveness of my children. We are all fleshly. We are all human. We stand in your presence today and we ask you for strength. We ask you for wisdom. We ask you for compassion. We ask you for kindness. We ask you for boldness to share with our children the love of Christ. I pray, Lord, that these words have fallen on good ground this day that possibly lives, homes, marriages, and parental relationships could change because of your word. I praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's...